So you can start, the recording started, Joe, so you can start anytime. Yeah, I, I just need to pull up a, a doc. Like I said, I'm, uh, everything just got kind of messed up on me. Anyhow, everybody just gives me one second here because now I need to pull this up again. I'm working off of multiple screens and uh, I had everything nice and organized. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. It's 6.30. Will everybody please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we will have our roll call. Commissioner Huggins present, Commissioner Johnson present, Commissioner Freiberger present, Commissioner Burnett present, I'm sorry, and Commissioner Fatizi present. Hey so Joe, a, no, a note on that. We do not have it, the- Hey uh, Joe, Joe, a, yeah. a note on that. It's, um, it's customary for the, the members to acknowledge their presence on their own. Uh, if you could, in the future, I'll allow them to acknowledge that they're here I, instead I of just that. saying that they're here for, in, in, instead of allowing them to speak. You know, John, the whole virtual thing, I could see everybody's face, I guess. And, and uh, I'm having technical problems where I'm at as well. So everybody's going to need to bear with me a little bit. But uh, I definitely make a note of that. But uh, like I said, the whole virtual thing when you're not present with things is a little bit, uh, a little bit different. So uh, I'll, I'll work on that. So I don't believe we have minutes from the January 18th minute, meeting minutes at this point. Is that correct? That is correct. So I will open the general public's comment section at 632. And do we have anyone that uh, emailed or called or is present uh, at this time that would like to say anything? So is that- I see that there's one person know? that is not uh, staff or planning commission on the meeting. So if you wanted, if you had any comments at this time, you could go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Otherwise, uh, we'll move on. Would that person like to introduce themselves? Is that HT? Oh, hi. Yeah, our, my name is uh, Harry Dawson, and I'm a, a recent recently moved to Seeker Woolly, but I didn't have anything to say. I just wanted to kind of follow along. Well, thank you. Welcome to, welcome to town. And uh, if you do in the future, this would be the uh, forum to uh, participate in. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. So at this point, I will close the general public comments meeting at, at 6.33, period, I'm sorry. And uh, John, I think uh, you have the floor now on our unfinished business side. All right, so uh, as many of the planning commissioners remember, last uh, year about this time, we spent uh, several uh, planning commission meetings talking about uh, updates to the design standards as they affect the existing buildings and new buildings in the central business district. Um, the, first, we examined the, the issues that we were seeing, and then we examined our existing, plan, our existing planning documents, including the design review standards and guidelines, specifically chapters two and three apply to businesses in the downtown. Chapter two applies to all development, and chapter three is specific to um, the central business district design of buildings and signs. Um, the planning commission looked at, also looked at design standards from other communities to look to see what the other communities had to offer that we might like to put into our design standards and get some good ideas from or, um, uh, things not to do, possibly. Uh, 
so we looked at the planning commission looked at Arlington and Snohomish and Sumner. And I'm sure the planning commission, we also kind of spoke of other design standards and other communities uh, just in general throughout this uh, review period. Uh, Arlington, Sumner, and Snohomish. I'm not sure what I just said, but Arlington, Sumner, and Snohomish. I feel like I said one of those incorrectly. Um, and then we, the Planning Commission continued on to have a lengthy and detailed conversation at the end of uh, July, um, talking about what they would like to see our design standards uh, look like. We had the staff had presented a kind of a bare bones uh, update of the, the design standards in the central business district. And after a lot of good discussion, uh, it was now in the hands of staff to synthesize that information that the planning commission provided and put it into writing into the uh, amendments to the chapter three CBD design standards. Um, Nicole uh, listened to the all of the meetings minutes for all of the meeting videos for the uh, for this project and tried to glean all of the information freshly um, and of course remind herself or to learn about this project because it started before she started here so she did a good job of learning where the planning commission started and where we ended and drafted the amendments in the, uh, attachment two of the memo that you have. Uh, a note on those draft amendments is you're, you're gonna see several colors, several different types of strike throughs. There's double underlying underlines. There's um, all sorts of different things going on uh, and that's that reflects reflects all of the different times that we've worked on this. So you know, first we made some uh, amendments, I think, in uh, June and then July uh, or May and then July and then now um, some other text underlines things double underline when. Uh, when it's been deleted from one section, but just moved. So, you know, a lot of the things you'll see are stricken out and you may look at it and go, oh, that looks good. Why did we strike that out? It's very likely that it was actually just moved to another portion of the, uh, of the document. We did a lot of formatting changes uh, as far as um, trying to have, stick to the, the, um, the heading structure of um, so we have uh, two major sections: building design and uh, I think it's um, building design and sign design. So those are like two general sections within Chapter Three, and then within each of those sections, we'll have like a bolded section. So for example, general storefront profile. And then under that we'll have intent, which kind of gives the background of that uh, general storefront profile and what we're trying to achieve. So yeah. narrative around what led us to the standards that we're, that we're providing. And then the next indent would be uh, standards. And the standards are things that are required um, for new development and, and uh, changes to buildings in the central business district. And then there's another indent uh, subheading of, of guidelines and those are encouraged, not required items. So that is the, that is the format that we have, a, yeah. a bold section, uh, like a, a broader heading, intent, standards and guidelines. So, the previously didn't read like that. It got kind of, to be honest, as staff that was interpreting this and trying to apply it to applications as we received them, it was difficult to navigate because it was unclear what really was a standard and what was just um, discussion points. So we tried to <clears throat> make it a lot easier for us to administer 
on the back end after a, a permit is submitted. So thank you to Nicole for putting all of that together. And didn't do a whole lot of work on signs um, because this effort was really intended to address um, uh, buildings. As you recall, last year in 2021, the Planning Commission spent several months discussing digital signs in the Central Business District and in the city as a whole. And as part of that process, we kind of beat the sign thing to death. And you know, that's kind of a colloquial way of saying, we studied it very detailed and made uh, necessary adjustments to our uh, our development regulations. So signs are covered pretty well. Uh, and that was a little bit outside of the scope. We did address some formatting in that also um, and uh, moved in some of the, uh, some of the information from the last ordinance that uh, we, that we did talking about design uh, digital signs. So that's my long, well, it's almost my long winded, so I'm not quite done. One of the things that the Planning Commission wanted to see was also uh, some better definitions for some of the terms used throughout the document. So Nicole also found definitions for awning, canopy, and marquees, and included those in, uh, in this draft as well. So what that required us to do is bring in chapter 11 of the design standards, which is the definitions section. Uh, so you'll see in there again, on the, the, the last two pages of the memo and the attachment is <clears throat> the underlined information explaining what is new in that definition section. It's only two pages long. Um, hopefully those work uh, for you. I think they were pretty good definitions that we found. And if there's any other definitions that we think need to happen to this uh, as a result of this document, we're happy to put those in since we're doing a thorough review. What I was hoping we could do today is, is go over these, uh, these proposed amendments. Um, I appreciate that it's been a long time since we talked about this. So if the Planning Commission needed to kind of re you know get their minds back into this issue that, that that's understandable um, if you've learned any more information since then and had any epiphanies I know this topic's been in my mind a lot every time I drive through the area with any sort of historic buildings um, or new buildings in his in older parts of town um, in other cities uh, I, I try to glean ideas and have been putting it into this as we go. And I think I probably have a few more that I've come up with since I even wrote this that may make it into the next draft. Um, so if you could provide feedback on this, we did not schedule a public hearing today because I uh, wanted the Planning Commission to get a fresh look at it and not have to jump in and then do a public hearing and make a decision. So we do anticipate that we're close enough that any changes between now and next, uh, any, any changes that we come up with today should hopefully be fairly minor. If, if you want great changes, uh, that's fine. Uh, we can do that. We're just kind of expecting like, well, maybe, maybe we'll be ready to make some <clears throat> final touches on this and bring it for a public hearing at the next planning commission meeting. But that'll be up to you. Now I'm done with my long-winded intro. John, that was awesome. I, I have to tell you, you guys did a great job on this and I was going to beat this camera into submission until I got it to work. And it is a little bit flustering uh, under this format sometimes. So- We can't see you now. No, no, I-, I, I <laughs> Anyway, this was, this was uh, just a great read for uh, I think any of us to uh, really understand what we're actually looking at and how to articulate it. And I think all the meat here is really in the attachment two. So if anybody else would like to uh, kick on into attachment two, uh, have at it. I know Pat, this is a very passionate part of uh, 
your uh, profession as to what you really uh, enjoy, number one, and anybody else have at it, I'm done. We're going to need to unmute. Perhaps um, adding a definition for dental molding. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but um, my Dent, dental work is uh, yeah. is quite literally the little um, notches down that kind of look like teeth that mm -hmm. would typically be seen on the underside of uh, the, the the parapet. Yeah, but we can add that. Nicole's, I'm sure, taking notes and we'll be adding that. If you think it's useful. So it, it, is, it was helpful do get that having a lot. It, it was helpful. It's mentioned so many times in the document, and it was helpful to see it, um, you know, um, illustrations, of course, but definitions are also helpful. Oh, much better. That one, an illustration goes a long way. So we'll work on that. Uh, Commissioner Frenette. Um, great job, Nicole, on this document. Um, probably drove you crazy to read it a thousand times, but uh, thank you. Uh, I was reading the, in since we're in definitions right now, I was reading the awning, canopy, and marquee. And I know exactly what you're trying to say, and, and it, it's well spelled out, but I was just wondering if instead of off the side of the building, all of them say off the side. Um, I know you mean off the vertical, but I was looking at other definitions and they say over the entrance um, or over the sidewalk, but didn't know if you wanted to add a little bit of extra to that. Yeah, that's a, a good idea I, I can look into adding that yeah but it's not also not exclusively over an entrance either no I mean, it's I, not I'm just, I mean I'm just trying to think of my office here down on Warner and Metcalf and we have them over our windows too yeah that was more my my interpretation of using the the side of the building because yeah. yeah I've seen them over windows too so and speaking of um, visuals um, the word just slipped my mind um, were we going to have drawings or photos or something to show what we meant in the final draft In the final draft, yes. Um, we can, yeah. Illustrations what? were going to be no, added yeah. on for, um, <laughs> for the sake of formatting. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, some of those other documents we saw from other cities or towns, the ones that had the visuals, either uh, photos or sketches, were very helpful. Were there any terms or illustrations that you had in mind? Who, me? You or any of the planning commission, uh, if there are specific terms that, or, you know, types of illustrations that you think would be useful, um, you know, like dental work, for example, you know, we're gonna provide an illustration of that because uh, it's hard to, hard to envision. Um, I'm, I'm thinking we might do a, a illustrations of a, an awning or a marquee or, all of them to kind of show the difference between of them. Wainscoting might be a useful one to have in the definitions as well. And potentially an il illustration of that. I know it's mentioned and There is an illustration somewhere of some of these things. And of course, now that I'm looking for it. <laughs> but yeah. Nope. 
I, I need to apologize because I had the, uh, I didn't have it in a gallery view. So Danielle, I couldn't see you if you were on the other side, but now that I have it in the view, I could see everybody. So uh, raising a hand, if anybody wants to have a uh, comment, at least I can see everyone and uh, kind of manage this a little bit better than uh, like I said in, in the past. I, I have a question on the awnings and uh, Nicole, maybe you can answer this. It says size and scale of awnings, canopies and marquees shall relate to that of the building architecture and features. So I guess my question is this, over time, even though you start with a general architecture and features, things do change, right? The windows, especially for one, uh, doorways, things like that. So how would, we look at, how would we look at a size and scale of awnings, canopies, and marquees relating, would it be like the current architecture or what's your idea on that? I'm thinking the current architecture, okay. that was, yeah. You know, Commissioner Huggins has spoke about this several times about um, keeping in the vernacular of the buildings next door, like when designing a new building, you wanna keep in, keep in mind the buildings adjacent. So it's really just meant to be a broad term, uh, okay. a broad, way for us to administer what would be allowed. So, you know, we wouldn't allow different types of, of you know, different kind of awning, uh, maybe a, a fancy shiny metal awning on a building that is brick and um, more ornate, you know, it would be you know, angular and, and, and shiny doesn't go with um, the, with a, like a brick building with white, um, the white inlay brick and whatnot, but it might go well with one of the fifties buildings that are more, um, you know, flat front. I'm thinking uh, the, the building that is now currently the uh, restless and reuse, what's it called? The, 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 uh, the place that repairs and resells vintage furniture. That building itself doesn't have a lot of historic architecture to it. So you can have different details on the front of that building than you can say the building next door. And you don't want to mix, mix and match those period types. I, if that's what I was trying to trying to say. Do you want more, uh, for lack of a better term, more definition outside of it shall be well constructed so as not to pose a safety hazard? What would somebody's definition of what they think is well constructed versus what maybe OSHA or some other agency? Might have is there something that maybe L and I has or some other definitions of what well constructed actually is, right? You might you might think something is well constructed, but you might not. So, but you know, it's kind of a moot point because you need a building permit for. Okay. You know. what, what would be the standards for a building permit when when they present something like that? What do you look at? Well constructed, um, safe, kind of that definition in, in, in the hand. <laughs> in a nutshell. Really, it's just, it, it, it can't uh, come down on its own, be blown down. Uh, it needs to have wind loading calculations. Okay. If it's projecting from the building, that sort of thing. This, uh, Commissioner Johnson, and then Commissioner Freiberger right up ahead. Go ahead. Um, kind of getting back, John, to um, the requests about specifics on uh, visuals. And I, I apologize, I can't give you specific as far as the previous municipal municipalities that we've reviewed, but um, under, so under the first uh, building design general storefront profile, um, that second page where you kind of go into Art Nouveau era and false fronts. Um, I mean, it may be, um, good to plug in a, maybe a couple images there um, 
just because, you know, I feel like, you know, we, you guys really did write up, you know, kind of a good explanation of Art Nouveau, but, you know, picture always has, says a thousand words and, you know, who knows what the eye of the interpreter is. And so, um, you know, having, especially since this is store frontage, you know, most of the CBD anyways, um, you know, I think uh, the entrances in particular, kind of just highlighting um, the historical feel is, is kind of um, important. So, you know, I, that's probably two areas that I would recommend having visuals. So illustration for Art Nouveau and... And uh, oh, false front. Commissioner Freiberger, you're next. So I had more a question kind of for clarification. Um, on page 17, so it's under general storefront profile, but standards under required, it, it lists A through J of the required. And then it says, in addition, may include any of the following as part of requirements. So they're just other options to kind of give people suggestions, but there have to be five things chosen from that initial list. Is that how I'm, is that correct? What, what would be the incentive, I guess, for people to use these other additional things? You know, that was something that I had a little bit of a hard time understanding myself. Be um, because because if you can't sub them in. Right. So um, that, was stole, that was stolen from the UVMU design regulations, I believe, Nicole. And so what that represents is, um, a lot of these are pulled from the general requirements for all buildings in chapter two. And then in the UVMU chapter, we added additional requirements K through P uh, that would also you know, give more possibilities in the UVMU. So I'll take a look at the structure of that. That's important, mm -hmm. thank you. I, I don't know. Oh. Sorry. Go, go ahead, finish your, finish your thought. I, yeah. I don't know if it would be relevant, but you, as you pointed out, I saw the, those initial ones already in chapter two. So the additional ones could almost be somehow, if there was a way to kind of bring them forward uh, to really encourage them to also be used in addition since chapter two already lists the others. But I don't, I don't know if you can just take out the, the ones from, from chapter two because they're kind of, I guess, necessary. So I, I don't know, I'm just kind of trying to figure out how to, how to make them both work better. So, so. What, so what we were trying to achieve, and I, and I agree it's a little confusing. When we did the UVMU standards, um, the urban village mixed use uh, overlay standards, which is a different area entirely, um, we were trying to create a similar, like to a downtown walkable neighborhood. So we did something similar to what these uh, CBD standards are, mm -hmm. was we take the, we took the uh, standards and guidelines from chapter two, buildings for all, you know, design standards for all buildings and imported them into the UVMU standards so you didn't have to go back and forth between the two chapters and say, well, this chapter says I got to require this. And then you come to chapter, the next chapter and says, well, you, then you also have to require, require this on top of it. So. Um, and that's helpful. I'll, I'll, I'll look at a, So I'll look yeah. at a way to make this less confusing. What it says is um, ground floor, street facing facades of commercial areas and mixed use buildings shall incorporate at least of the following elements. Uh, I'm not sure why listed A through J got stricken. So you, so you have to pick five from A through J. And then in addition, you have to pick um, any one of the following, doesn't say one, but any 
of the following. Oh, and then there's K through J. So we can say, we can just list all of them in one list, but I think the intent was you wanted to get a bare minimum of, of these and then take then then you pick from a different list of additional, which gives you a, you know a higher level. Whether and, and, you know how it works in practical, I don't know. Uh, actually, just that different wording that you said in there. If if it changed it to say in addition, applicants must or or need to pick at least one from here to kind of make it so that they actually otherwise there's no real incentive to choose those additional ones. Uh, they're basically there kind of as a suggestion, I guess, an FYI. So, so that is all I was saying is that I felt like it should be a little bit more tied in and, and more um, have more of a purpose. So I will leave in, so uh, I'll make it clear that first you pick five from A, a through J and then you pick uh, one from uh, K through P, unless you want more from K through yeah. P. Yeah, yeah, one or more. Does yeah. the planning commission want two? Do they want three? Do they want four from K through P? Commissioner Huggins, you're up next. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I also wanted to say um, great job on, um, on, on the work on this. It really uh, reads a lot better than uh, uh, than it did and um, is much more informative. Uh, I have uh, two things I wanted to say. One, um, everything that John said was true, but um, my, my major concern with, uh, with the building is actually the, um, every building has a, um, both a, a horizontal uh, and a vertical modulation. And we're pretty careful with our, our horizontal modulations. You know, we, we want buildings to be broken up. So, you know, you have column window, column door, column window, column door, or some kind of modulation that, um, breaks up the, the length of the building and uh, makes it interesting. Um, but uh, what I'm concerned mostly about in downtown Cedar Woolley is, is failures to, um, to uh, pay attention to the, adjoint, the, the adjacent building's uh, modulation vertically, where um, you, know, you don't want a window that comes, or a windowsill on your building coming into the middle of the window on the building next door. I mean, unless that's your intent, um, for some reason, uh, you really don't want that to happen. So it's, it's nice to be uh, sympathetic, at least to the, the building on either side of you in terms of making your window sills rough, roughly the same height or as close as you can staying within your design. I mean, if you have a totally different vision, then you got to do the thing. But, um, but anyway, um, I see a lot of hodgepodge architecture when I go through um, other towns. You know, some towns get it right. Cedar Willie's mostly got it right. But um, some places, you know, you have those things where you're driving down the street and everything looks nice and the buildings are all different, but their modulation stays the same. And all of a sudden you've got, you know, like um, on ours, it's the, uh, the old Courier Times building, which was next to the one that burned down. And it's the 1950s and the modulation of the windows don't match anything else in town mm -hmm. as do the materials. So anyway, um, that, that was one of my concerns. Um, has always been one of my concerns in town is that we, you know, have sympathy with the modulation. The other thing I wanted to um, to to bring up was, and and I'm I'm not trying to nitpick. Um, we have a definition for for Clara story, and I don't believe we have any Clara stories um, in town, but we do have what's called transom windows, and they they at first look they might seem the same, but they're they're different. Um, a transom window is a window above the transom of the door or large window. And that's what we have. So you have the door and then there's the transom above it. And then there's a window above that or a row of windows above that. And that's what uh, our, our downtown buildings have. Clara stories basically are the same thing, but usually uh, because they were designed originally in, um, in cathedrals and stuff like that, uh, Clara stories usually have a roof below them, a sloped roof below them and a roof above them. And so they're letting in light basically through a roof, um, and that, that's the difference. Um, whereas the transoms are just on the vertical wall above the window. Um, a Clara story could be inset um, uh, further into the uh, building. 
So I, um, anyway, it'd be nice to have a, all I'm asking for is like a, a definition for, um, for transom window and, and Clara's story window because they're, they're different things. Yeah, so Clara's story says, uh, a continuous band of windows located just below the ceiling of a generally tall and important space. So in a small building, that may come down and basically act the same as a transom window. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it, but that would really be, you're right. That would be a transom window because it's just above the, the large window or door. Yeah. Whereas a clear story is really intended for, I mean, it says it in here, it's generally a tall building. Mm -hmm. um, so architecturally it would be some, some really tall 20 story interior room um, they were, there would be, um, windows at the top of that building. Like you wouldn't be able to see people on the street from it. And you wouldn't, you know, if you were in the room, you'd just be looking up at it and not uh, be able to, um, yeah. see much besides the sky. Yeah. And if you want clear examples, like I said, just look at, um, look at old churches. If they have a sloped roof on them, if they're tall enough, uh, up there somewhere will be a clear story window, but the roof will go up so far. And then there'll be a gap and there'll be windows, a strip of windows in there. And then there'll be the, the roof that's over the actual um, nave of the, of, the, of the church. So anyway, um, yeah. Uh, so there are, there are times when they could be the same thing, uh, but they actually are, are two different things you, most of the time. So Patrick, to, um, to address your concern with the modulation an articulation of windows. Um, I did put a note under the guidelines, and this is just encouraged under the doors and windows section. Um, it just says modulation and articulation of windows is encouraged. Is that something that you want to include maybe in standards or elaborate a little more on that? Well, the, the, the issue is, in, is, is that no matter what door or window you put in, it has a modulation by its existence, it, it, it's modulated. So that doesn't have any, um, I don't know that it even, we want teeth, but, but it doesn't have any teeth to it, right? Because every door automatically has a, a modulation. So what we're trying to do is have them at least explain why they have their window when they're building a building, why the, the window sill at the bottom of the window is running into the middle of the uh, window on the building next door and not uh, you know, uh, sympathetically uh, aligning with it or near, nearly aligning with it. And uh, again, I don't wanna tell architects what to do all the time or builders what to do all the time, but um, it is pretty jarring when you're, <laughs> when, uh, when you do it. And if you're trying to keep a particular, um, a particular standard um, for design in town, that, that would be something you wanna have is, uh, did you see the difference between what I'm saying is that yeah. one thing to just say it has to have modulation, but you want uh, modulation that's sympathetic to the, to the business, uh, the buildings on either side. So um, I think what we're hearing is move number four of guidelines into uh, standards and um, change it to read modulation and articulation of windows uh, shall architecturally respect the modulation and articulation of adjacent buildings. That's awesome. That'd be a great way to say it. Yeah. You want to throw in the word required? <laughs> well, shall is shall shall is a re, uh, okay. a, a require word that 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 means it is required. No. And it'll be under standards, which are required also. I am also going to ask that Nicole um, find definitions for modulation and articulation because, uh, and, and some sort of illustration because this, this is a difficult concept. Um, Mr. Huggins clearly has it um, down pat and, and when he sees it, it even causes him to blanch a little when it's not done right, the rest of us need a little education. So this is this is the method that we use to educate ourselves and the people and anybody that's designing a building. 
Thank you. I had another uh, comment. Go ahead. So I knew I had seen an illustration. It was back in chapter two. So something like that, that um, on oh, page 14 of uh, building design, it, uh, it shows a lot of those features, um, you know, the, the base, the middle and the top and kind of uh, up the, the uh, belt and the dental and the transom windows too, I think. So um, maybe something, yeah, that calls out that, that stuff. I don't know how many illustrations we need, but something that at least shows several of those things would be very helpful. We need a lot. Um, these are design standards. This is where we can, this is the, the most appropriate place to put illustrations, uh, photos, things that you don't see in most code. Uh, you know, code doesn't generally include a lot of, uh, of, of illustrations and pictures and things. The design standard is the appropriate way to do it. People should look through this and be like, oh, I get it. Oh, that looks good. Oh, yeah, I'd like my building to look like that. Instead of, you know, instead of just confusing people into not wanting to read it. So the more we use, the better in a document like this. So we're happy to fill it up with photos and illustrations. And there's a second illustration on, on page uh, 15 that, that shows even more. So, yeah, that was... Again, you can explain it, but like you said, when you actually see it, then it suddenly all makes sense. So, yeah. Is that under ground level details and massing? Uh, on, yes. Yep, it goes into page 15 is where the actual um, illustration is for that. And, because I was, I was having a hard time figuring out medallion, what exactly that meant, and belt course. Even though we do have a definition for belt course, we don't have one for medallion, but uh, I suppose it's somewhat self-explanatory, but at least the uh, an illustration shows it right away, so. John, did you, um, I, I, I dropped off some standards that, um, that I was given when I first got on the planning commission, when we used to have a, um, an architectural review board and uh, it was pretty thick and it had i don't remember that it was that it was wordy but it had a lot of illustrations of um art nouveau style uh, stuff and uh, i assumed you had one at the at, at the city hall because that's where i got my copy from years ago but you, uh you dropped off your so i think you recently dropped off your um your municipal code or your comp plan book, the big blue book, is that the one you're talking about? It was the blue, it well, I, I dropped off the blue book, but with it, I dropped off a um, one that's uh, had a, a um, Art Nouveau um, uh, design on the front of it and it, and it said um, architectural standards. And that was the standards that our old um, architectural review board did. So when people wanted to do something on the main street, they submitted their, um, their design to the architectural review board and we did that up until 2002 uh, roughly and um and then there wasn't enough people that wanted to be on architectural review board and mark christ retired um and so uh and so you know we just put it put it away and came up with these design standards um and so i didn't know if there was a copy laying around so i dropped mine off there anyway uh, it doesn't sound like you you saw that yeah uh I've seen a few things like that around. Um, I don't recall you dropping that off. We'll yeah, look not, you weren't there when I did it. Um, I, I don't remember who I dropped it off with at the counter there, but anyway, and, I, and I, it wasn't like I was expecting you to incorporate all of that into this, but I just was saying it, it gave a lot of really nice illustrated examples of storefronts and, and, um, and uh, facades that, uh, that pe people in the nineties at least thought were uh, uh, fit with the uh, Art Nouveau uh, things so anyway uh, no that i, I, I appreciate that that's if we can find that then i can find it how even possibly find it electronically and then we can just copy the illustrate the, the useful illustrations out of it yeah um at a minimum um and you know maybe there's maybe there's some nuggets in there that we might even yeah. uh some of the text and standards that we might want to drag in 
Yeah, I don't so remember it being very texty, but um, but yeah, I thought it might save you some time hunting for uh, for illustrations. Is all I. I don't know that that document was ever adopted because you know I've got I've done a pretty comprehensive review of the the adopted documents for design review, and I haven't come across that one. Um, well, it wouldn't if it, if it was. I mean, adopted, I don't know how... It would technically still be in in uh, effect because I've never unadopted it unless yeah. it was unadopted when. Uh, we did these design standards, uh, I think it was in 2003, when these or four when these were originally adopted. Right. Well, I don't know all the workings of, of, <laughs> of how all the layers of city government work, but, but the Architectural Review Board may have adopted them and used them. And when they went out of existence, I mean, they were never incorporated into the, yeah. into the city uh, planning you know, documents. So I, I, I really don't know what, uh, what their- It was called Architectural was. Review. What's that? What was it titled? Um, shoot, I should have wrote it down. <laughs> should have kept my copy. Um, it, it just said, I remember it said architectural something, architectural review, architectural board, architectural uh, standards. I don't remember what. Uh, we'll look exactly. around for it. I, I, I've got some ideas. Yeah, you'll see it. You'll know it. It's got a, it's, it's black and white and it's got a, a Art Nouveau uh, design on the, on the front page of it. So I think I know which one it is actually. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to drag you guys through all of that. I just uh, thought it might save some time when you were looking for illustrations. Commissioner Fournette, did you have your hand up just earlier? Oh, no, I was okay. scratching my head or something. Okay. <laughs> but thanks. <laughs> Anyone else? So John, what, what, what's your plan moving forward? Uh, you were talking about the potential uh, public hearing. Do you want to do that at the next meeting or the meeting thereafter to give you, because this is a pretty you know, uh, complicated uh, project, it seems, by the time you find all the different illustrations to embed into the overall uh, design guideline document. What, what would you like to do? It's on you and Nicole to uh, feel what your time uh, lines are. I, I I think we can do it. From what you from the the um, feedback we've got today, there's no major work to be done. It's just a lot of little filler work, and we okay. we already we know what we're looking for. It's just kind of plugging it in and you know fleshing out some definitions and rewording things. It's 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 very doable work. Finding the illustrations and getting the darn thing formatted properly is going to be probably the most consternation of it. Um, so, so far from what I've heard from planning commission's feedback, I think we could easily have a uh, public hearing at the next meeting. Okay, I'm just trying to be respectful of uh, other things you might have going on down there right now. So if you feel that that's uh, a totally achievable objective, no, I think that's great. The council's the council's interested in seeing this move forward too. So the, okay. there's not 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 a good reason to to slow it down. Or just get her done. No, I get it. Do we want to discuss anything more about parking? It, it, it's always been a big deal. So on attachment one, I went looking through it, and uh, it, for me, it was just an education basically. But do we have any more commentary on parking since uh, it seems to always rear its ugly head every now and then? That would be a good thing. So the commission did a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty <laughs> big uh, push on, on parking regulations lately. Um, and we're still waiting to see how that bears out because we okay. haven't had any significant development uh, occur yet that would need to take care of it take uh, advantage of those we have uh, talked to people in preliminary but no um and how it would affect them but nothing nothing that's uh, received permits for okay so at this point uh, let's move on into uh, planning commission discussion and information items the floor is anybody's. Uh, raise your hand. Is there anything uh, anybody would like to discuss? Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. So I know you're probably going to 
have a lot of questions about where we're going. And if this is a kind of a good segue, you were saying, you know, you want to be respectful of what uh, the planning department is going to be bringing to the, you know, doing. Very so, much so. Yes. We, yeah. we, we are entering the 2020 comp plan cycle. Okay. And uh, the, the list of things that we want to achieve has mushroomed into quite a, quite a list. So it's going to start at the March 2nd work session. That's a joint city council planning commission work session. I had mentioned in the email that we're gonna be doing that. Uh, that meeting is going to be a uh, hybrid. So you can attend in person or in uh, or via Zoom, whichever, however you're more comfortable. It will be held in the city council chambers because um, that way we can have the, the that's, that's where the, these meetings have moved because we've got the better AV system for uh, the hybrid meetings. So the planning commission members would sit on the side Mm -hmm. uh, bank of, of chairs. That's usually for staff during city council meetings. City council will sit in their usual spot and staff will be out in the, out in the field there. <clears throat> the meeting itself is going to have a couple of agenda items. First is the 2022 proposed docket items. And there's no major changes to any elements of the comp plan, but we are bringing up potential uh, recommended changes to several elements. So um, first, um, it's gonna, we're going to be uh, amending the capital facilities element <clears throat> to incorporate the new school capital facilities plan, which is adopted by reference into our comp plan. In there, they keep their uh, their impact fee calculations. So we need to put it into our comp plan and get it adopted, and at the same time update our uh, our code to reflect their fees. So we can now start charging their their proposed impact fees, and it's it's a significant uh, increase, but it's still. You know, it, it's not as high as other school districts by any means. Uh, so you'll you'll take a look at that, um, and I'm going to go over this in detail at the March meeting too. So I, I'm just going to give you a, a little pre preview here, so you know what's coming your way. Uh, Public Works Department has to update um, any parts of the comprehensive plan and code that address uh, source control which is like a stormwater thing. Um, so they'll be making some amendments to the transportation element and chapter two uh, <clears throat> of the comp plan to address source control. So updating language to make sure that it meets uh, state requirements. So that's, so that's a state required thing that they'll be, be, do, uh, be doing. So again, so, you know, important changes, but not massive changes. We're also going to be uh, opening up the parks and rec element and looking at the impact fee calculations. And uh, the plan, the city council wanted to look at possibly increasing parks impact fees to account to, um, to allow for more parks projects, parks development projects. So uh, we'll look at that. How much work that's going to require, we don't really know yet until um, we get it open. And finally, some transportation plan other, uh, stuff. You know, every couple of years, uh, the public works director, Mark Freiberger, needs to amend the transportation element to reflect current projects and uh, the state of the transportation system. So we're going to open that. He's having it, some modeling done to see what the, the new projections of traffic are. And he'll have a lengthy presentation on that because he's done a lot of work on it. But it's not a major rewrite. It's uh, just doing some updates. We're in you know 2022. Currently, 
Uh, the state requires that uh, all, all cities in Skagit County update their comprehensive plans uh, every eight years. So, uh, well, I guess it's nine years. It's due in 2025. June of 2025 is our ma next major comprehensive plan update. So now's not a time to go whole hog on any of the elements because we're gonna be updating them, starting that process in probably a year and a half. So we're done in time. If, you know, if we're due in 2025, we'll probably start in 2023. So we're, we're pretty close to kicking off our, our major GMA update <clears throat> cycle, which would be urban growth areas, uh, population forecasting, the whole nine yards. Um, and a lot of things have changed and are probably going to change uh, that affect our population density issues. Um, you, you've probably been following the, the proposed legislation to change density requirements in single family zones to allow, uh, to require that cities allow uh, duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes in a, in a town like Cedro Woolley. In larger towns, it has a much greater effect. That's moving through quickly, the legislature. Uh, also, um, also the, um, the tiny, tiny homes is in the legislature um, uh, pushing tiny homes. Is it tiny homes or accessory dwelling units? It's tiny homes, yeah. Um, the, the less than 500 square foot, they, they want those allowed. Um, I think partly for the uh, like emergency housing and stuff like that, but they actually have the people from, I was watching the, the state's station, whatever that is, 23 or whatever. But anyway, they were, um, they were talking about, they had the tiny home people there presenting their side uh, for that in Olympia last week. There is, there's also a bill, uh, I'm not familiar with that one, um, but I'll have to look out for that one. There's also a bill to change how we, uh, how cities handle accessory dwelling units. And the way it's written right now, uh, we, we would be required to eliminate our um, owner occupancy requirement. Um, they're also re, uh, requiring that we allow, I think it's two ADUs per lot as long as it's over 4,300 or 4,500 square feet, something like that. Like an, an attached and a detached. Um, but, you know, it's still midway through the legislative process. So it, it, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna get too worried about what the specifics of the language of what it says today. I read, I read the most recent uh, gross state bill. So that's the there was the draft and then there was a revision and then there's this one. So this is the third one and it's uh, changed a little, uh, but that one's moving really fast. Um, so the effect of these are on density. So <clears throat> if all of our single family zones and uh, all of our residential zones are now going to accommodate more units because of the ADUs and the duplexes and triplexes and fourplexes. That means we can accommodate more density in our existing zones in our, in our existing urban growth area. So that would um, possibly affect our need to expand our urban growth area, which good or bad, you know, it's just, it is what it is. Yeah, Eric. Uh, do you happen to know the bill numbers on the ADUs or the duplex, triplex, fourplex legislation? I can get that to you while you guys chat. I do. Thank you. Um, so where I was going is 2025, we're doing the full meal deal GMA update to our comp plan. So right now we're just kind of doing some little updates. Uh, and then in, uh, then at the end of that session, we're going to do a, a video for open public meetings act training. It's a required thing that, uh, city council and planning commission have to go through 
annually. Uh, you probably recall I've sent you these videos like for you to watch uh, on your own and then report back and self-certify. I haven't had a lot of um, a lot of people do that and report back. So uh, plan B is to just force you to watch it at a at a city council meeting. <laughs> But uh, we're also looking to have uh, a question and answer session as part of that too. Just make it a little bit more engaging. And that is what's planned for March 2nd. Beyond that, we'll be rushing the, you know, whatever it's, uh, whatever it's gonna be on the docket to the city council at the next planet, this next city council meeting, which would be seven days later. So is that the ninth uh, for them to officially set the docket? which means planning commission could be reviewing the 2022 comp plan at the March 15th meeting. So we're on fast track, at least some part of the, the comp plan at the March, um, March 15th meeting. And then, you know, some of those are small, so they, they might just be you know, a, a review and then a public hearing at the next one and then be done. So we're, we're actually anticipating we could jam the, you know, or that's a bad word. We could um, move very quickly in our review of the 2022 comp plan updates and be done maybe in June at the planning commission. Here, here's a reason. question. Maybe even May. I have a question. So whatever comes out of Olympia and just listening to and actually following what these proposals are, it's uh, it's basically the bigger jurisdictions pretty much pushing their own agenda to the uh, remainder of the state. Our problem is our transportation. Since we do have a lot of available land that you can literally put the five pounds of potatoes into the one pound bag, we got a serious issue right now on Cook Road, on Highway 20. Everybody's heading westbound to get to I-5. So I don't believe that whatever comes through the, the sausage grinder, so to speak, it needs to take the composition of the transportation infrastructure prior to requiring a, a city or any other jurisdiction to uh, allow pretty much unbridled growth, because this is what it looks like to, pretty much everybody here. So anyway, it's gonna be interesting and nobody knows anything right now. So, and how would that affect us by the way? So let's say they do push that through, like they change our ADU to now require two and everything else that the state is now going to require. That would be a big modification to our, to our overall code overall. Overall what? Uh, our overall zoning code for five, sevens, pretty much everything. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And our it, current it, requirements don't get grandfathered in? Depends on what it says. <laughs> depends on how the legislation passes. And it's then of ultimately, you know, last year there was a very similar ADU rule right. that mm -hmm. passed legislature and then the, the uh, governor vetoed sections of it which uh, eliminated some of the, the, a lot of things, really the meat of it. Um, the interesting thing was the reason he vetoed it was he didn't feel it went far enough. So um, that's, that's my understanding of the reading of the veto, uh, which means it kind of set the table for uh, a more robust change uh, this year. Uh -huh. So the middle housing bills is uh, is HB seventeen eighty two and and SB fifty six seventy. Those are companion bills. So you can either look look up either one and they, uh, on the ledge site. And um, I'm sorry. What, what was that? Seventeen eighty two and what? And so HB House Bill seventeen eighty two and Senate Bill fifty six seventy. So they're two separate companion bills. But if you go to the ledge page for HB 1782, it's got a link to the companion bill, SB 5670. And a 
looking up the um, looking up the ADU bill for you. Concerning accessory dwelling units is HB House Bill 1660. Thank you. You guys are masochistic if you're going to follow it, but you know, anybody in the anybody can comment during the the, the ledge sessions. So, so they make it easier than ever. You can do it remotely now. I bet they'd be swayed additionally by people in position of planning commission and say things like, you know, hey, you know, we just worked on this. We very specifically tried to address these issues. We understand these facts in our community. And there's a lot of housing advocates that, uh, that are, are involved. So, um, and the, the Association of Washington Cities, which is, you know, a, a conglomerate organization for Washington Cities, um, they're also our lobbying group. So they they request comments from the cities around the state, and and then they speak on our behalf to save us time, so we don't all have to go. Otherwise, we could all line up at ledge our own on our own, and uh, and and testify, but. <clears throat> that gets a little difficult because we used to have to drive down there. So since the March 2nd meeting is a, uh, a virtual meeting, it's uh, not I mean, a hybrid meeting, a hybrid meeting, I, I stand corrected. I, I wonder if uh, we can uh, draft Senator Wagoner to uh, participate in that. I mean, even if he's down in Olympia, he's, he's a big advocate of uh, this city number one and uh, maybe that'd be that might be something worth uh, throwing out there. He's always been our advocate, so he would be the best one to figure out what's going on since he's at ground zero. Call him up. Okay, I can do that, yeah. So that's all I had for Planning Commission information. Uh, I just wanted you to know there is a, truckload of comp plan stuff bearing down on you. So uh, I hope you're all excited to, uh, to to get into the 22 comp plan cycle. There's going to be a lot of different information coming at you. Um, and it's not going to not going to sit on your plates as long as a lot of these other long term projects will. So maybe it'll be maybe it'll be fun for you to pick it up and shoot up real quick and move on. <laughs> It sounds like there's a lot coming out of ever, out of every at, at everybody right now. So, <laughs> anybody else have any uh, anything to add to the discussion here? I um I, I just want to say there there's some um there's some information from back. Sorry, I'm going to drag up more history, but okay. um, there's some information from around 2001 through 2004 in that area. Um, they did a couple of visioning plans and a lot of information was presented to us back then about um, how you design your city affects um, the costs of infrastructure and, and stuff like that, you know? So the, the fact that the state is just gonna throw us all under the bus and make everybody live with Seattle's problems, basically, um, they're creating issues that we tried to solve back then, uh, for example, when you build a lot of apartment complexes, you have to double your fire department and you have to fire, you have to double your police department. That's expensive. Um, I'm just, I'm just spitballing, but I mean, that's basically what they were saying was, is that you have to hire more police. You have to have more fire equipment because you have all of these apartment complexes. And that was one of the reasons why back then we, uh, we put a, um, a moratorium on uh, converting any more land to um, our, it was R11 back then, uh, multifamily because we had quite a bit of multifamily land at the time and didn't wanna get into that situation where we were doing that. And the other thing that I, uh, you know, every time we compact and make it so that people don't have, uh, have smaller and smaller yards and stuff, open spaces become more and more um, important. And so we're gonna need more parkland in the city, which we're gonna have to buy. 
um, in order to have space for people to get out and do things because they're not going to be able to do it in their yard if they've got two ADUs, two ADUs in the backyard. So um, I'm not saying these things shouldn't happen, but every action has consequences. I look at housing like I look at inflation. You know, you you get paid money, you go out, you go out, and you know, bar bargain for more pay, and then inflation hits, and then everybody's back out bargaining for more pay, and it's just a cycle. And it's the same way with growth. You know, you can pack more people in, and you can uh, do it, but then you're gonna um, and you can make all these adjustments to try and get more people into houses, but ultimately you're not going to get anywhere because you have to provide more services, which costs money. You have to provide more park space, which costs money. You have to provide more sewer. You have to provide everything. It's going to cost more money. So you don't really get anywhere. So they're chasing in Olympia, from my point of view, they're just chasing a, a, uh, a unicorn's tail. So anyway, um, <laughs> that's my two cents worth and, uh, and be prepared because it's going to be, uh, it's going to be hard to balance and uh, organize all this so that we still have a functioning city uh, when, uh, when the legislature is done. Thank you. You didn't hear any disagreements. <laughs> so, so with that, uh, I would like to hear- I, I have, I have an here. interesting tidbit, somewhat related. So <laughs> back in 2000, when they were doing that, we didn't have impact fees. So at least now, as we see development, we uh, require fire impact fees. Um, we require parks impact fees. We require transportation impact fees. And as, uh, you know, Mark Freiberger says uh, all the time, because people complain about traffic all the time, is uh, with this new development, we get traffic impact fees and we use those to uh, do the projects that are necessary to improve the roads to handle the new growth. And, you know, any improvement you know, also is just good for the city. Um, it, it's not, you know, it's not specifically used for uh, backlog problems, um, but you know, in general, it, it gen as you do a new project, it, it often takes care of those problems as well. So, uh, yeah, and you know, the the reason we're seeing all these densification and ADU projects is is really just uh, it is it is a statewide issue. The um, the, the lack of available housing and the, the cost of housing. Um, it's kind of seen as, you know, by doing denser housing, you can produce housing cheaper. And so it makes more affordable housing and not that any housing is affordable anymore. But Skagit County, you know, even, I mean, it's been years and years now, we're still at this ridiculously low vacancy rate. It's, I think it's still hovering around 1%, which, if you know anybody that's looking for a new home, it it's terrible. And if you know anybody that is looking for a, a inexpensive place to live because they're you know at the fiftieth percentile of 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 earning, um, it's it's just almost impossible. So that's why that's the issue that legislature is trying to address. It's it really is statewide Whatcom and, and Skagit are some of the, the lowest uh, vacancy rates as well as, you know, of course, Seattle area. How they do it, you know, we can argue all day about whether it's right, but that's the issue that they're trying to do, trying to address. So with that, uh, give us a lot to sleep on. <laughs> is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. Second? I'll second that. Okay. Meeting is adjourned. It's 7.44 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Sorry about the uh, technical uh, problems on my end. Have a great day. We'll all talk soon. And we have a lot to think about. Thanks. <laughs>